Ja men hej på er, här har ni mig igen Jag har tagit tillbaks mikrofonen från den tokige brorsan Timpa Vilken galning, vilken galning <laughs> ja, ja men ni fick ju i alla fall ett litet avsnitt igår Här kommer det till eh, på en fredag kväll. Jag tänkte att ni kan inte vara utan mig så länge så jag får fixa det helt enkelt Men det blir inte mycket snack från mig, det kan jag säga Jag kommer att lägga in några klipp här det bästa från Tulsi Gabbards Town Hall med Trump om ni inte har sett det. Klipper bort lite onödiga grejer kanske. Men det är, det är roligt ändå att se Trump framförallt på slutet där när det är YMCA och han bara dansar där och håller på att flippa lite. Man ser hur Tulsi Gabbard tycker det är roligt. Demokrat som hon har varit fram tills nyligen. Sen Dr. Phil, man kan säga vad man vill om honom men han är absolut top notch när det gäller att intervjua kända personer. Och han har ju då intervjuat Trump i Las Vegas och då hände en grej som gjorde att han samtidigt i stort sett kunde intervjua Kennedy, RFK. Och det klippet kommer jag att lägga in här. Om man vill se hela den här intervjun med Trump och eh, Dr. Phil och hela intervjun med Kennedy också av Dr. Phil då ska man ladda ner hans app. Det är gratis, jag har precis gjort det. Man fyller bara i namn och e-mailadress så får du Merit Plus. Gå in på App Store eller om ni har en Samsung där ni köper. Det är väl Google Shop eller vad det heter. Gå ni in där och helt gratis ladda ner Merit Plus. M-E-R-R-I-T, mellanslag P-L-U-S. Merit Plus. Där kan man gratis se alla Dr. Phils fina intervjuer. Väldigt bra faktiskt. Så ja, nu är det helg. Jag önskar er en trevlig helg. Lyssna noga här vad Kennedy säger. Han säger precis som jag har sagt till er flera gånger. Diabetes... De här sjukdomarna vi pratar om kan botas genom rätt kost. De här sjukdomarna kom i explosionartad ja, vad ska man säga, fart sedan 1985 och framåt på grund av processad mat och kemikalier. Så att, eh, det är väldigt viktigt att ni lär er det här för att eh, demens, ALS, Parkinson, Alzheimer's, smärta, inflammation i kroppen med mer och mer. Det kommer jättefort efter sexårsåldern. För många innan sexårsåldern faktiskt. Och eh, så lyssna här vad han säger och tänk efter. Jag tänker göra avsnitt framöver där jag länkar lite och berättar exakt vad och hur man kan handla och laga mat och hur man ska äta ute på bästa sätt för att undvika det här. Det här är ingen small case. Det är inte som ni tror att jag är 70, det spelar inte med någon roll. Vadå? Tänk om du blir 80 eller 90, ska du må dåligt de åren eller, ch- eller chansa när man inte behöver. Det är med små, små medel du kan lära dig hur man undviker och backar åldrande, backar sjukdomar genom att äta fräsch och ren mat. Det är så det går till. Trump och Kennedy har ett mycket fint samarbete. Tulsi Gabbard är med på banan. Galningarna på demokratsidan hade ju då ja, CNN, Dana Bash. Alltså de är inte riktigt kloka där på sidan. De har alltså en liten intervju med Kamala Harris igår. Där hon har marxistkommunisten Tim Walsh. Åh oh, herregud, samma namn. Nej, nej, nej. Den valsande Walsen är till stöd då för kamelen. För hon kan inte snacka utan hjälp. Och hon kunde inte snacka ens med hjälp. Det gick åt pipan alltihopa. Jag tänker inte lägga det. Men hittar ni det på Youtube så kan ni ju se själv vad hon sitter och säger. Hon har inte bankat från några av sina policies. Hallå! Hon sitter och erkänner att hon vill fortsätta förstöra USA och världen. Det är galet ju. Helt galet. Ja, jag orkar inte längre. Jag önskar er en trevlig helg. Kolla på de här klippen. Mycket intressant. Så ses vi säkert snart igen i rutan och kanske till och med någon annanstans. Peace, love and understanding. What's your biggest fear if the Harris Walls ticket is successful? Are you going to actively campaign for President Trump? Yes, I will. You were also talking about being blackballed by the media. As soon as I said something sensitive, they shut off the feed. This isn't opinion. This is empirical science, evidence-based. Why do you think they're so threatened? Do you think you can be the determining factor in this presidential election? I was scheduled to fly into Las Vegas to interview former president and current Republican nominee Donald Trump to have a sit down interview with him to talk about what's happening in this run up to the election the last 76 days from Friday. Then we get word that RFK Jr. has a press conference and is going to make a really big announcement in Phoenix. So 
I called RFK Jr. and said, I got a sneaking suspicion what's going to happen. I'd like to talk to you when you walk off of that stage. So I did the interview with former President Trump, jumped on the airplane, flew into Phoenix and sat down and talked to RFK Jr. here. And as I'm sitting and talking to him, I'm very much aware that I may be talking to the one man that may be the single most outcome determinative individual on who is going to be the next president of the United States. So stay tuned and hear what RFK Jr. has to say that is so powerfully influential in the upcoming election. Robert, thank you for sitting down and talking to me. This has been a really pivotal day in your campaign, in your life, I'm sure. Yeah, it's a difficult day in, in many respects, but you know, I feel like I'm on the right path. You had, I think, close to, if not over a million people on your live stream for your press conference. And for anybody that is, is under a rock, you have suspended your campaign. You haven't dropped out of the campaign, you've suspended your campaign. How difficult was this decision? It was difficult. I mean, all of us, the people, you know, kind of the inner circle who were involved in the decision, I think everybody in that circle went back, did 180 degree turns maybe 15 times in the last two weeks trying to figure out what we can do. But ultimately, it was clear to me that because of the media censorship, because I was not going to be allowed on a, a debating stage, that I didn't really have it half the victory. So my choice was, am I going to spend the next 77 days, you know, rallying the troops and, and getting more money out of the donors without being able to offer them a path to victory? And I think that would have sucked my soul out. And then, I, you know, I had this interesting series of meetings with President Trump, in which he really surprised me by, by strongly endorsing the the mission for his presidency, saying that he wanted his legacy to end the chronic disease epidemic in this country. And that's been my central mission for the past 20 years, is addressing that issue. What's happening to our kids? We have the sickest children in the world. You know, when I was a kid, about 6% of American children had chronic disease. Today, it's 60%. And these are in basically major categories like neurological illnesses, which is AS, ADD, ADHD, speech delay, language delay, tics, Tourette's syndrome, narcolepsy, ASD, autism, autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and juvenile diabetes, and then the allergic diseases like peanut allergies and food allergies and eczema. And all of these appeared in the mid-1980s. Oh, you know, I never saw anybody with any of these diseases when I was a kid. No, I grew up in the 50s, and these weren't issues. They weren't issues. You didn't know anybody who had diabetes. You certainly did not know anybody who had autism. And now those... Or peanut allergies. Or peanut allergies. In fact, Congress asked the EPA, tell us what year these epidemics began. EPA scientists came back and said it's a red line, 1985. That, that gives us a hint about the culprits because we know it's not a genetic, gen, that genetic injury. Genes don't cause epidemics. They may provide the vulnerability, but you need an environmental exposure, an environmental toxin. And so something happened in our kids around that, at that time, and it's probably a lot of different exposures. The collapse of our food system, the industrialization of our food system, et cetera. You and I have talked before, and I've learned so much about you and so how deeply convicted you are about these things. And I tried to help millions of others that might not know how deeply convicted you are. I think we made a lot of progress in that regard. And I know that you're deciding to run and conducting this campaign came at a very high price to you personally, family-wise, professionally. And now as we sit here, I have to ask you, if you knew then what you know now, would you have done this? Yeah, I would have. I mean, I think it's been costly to me and it's been costly to my family, but I think I've advanced the issues in a way that is gonna be helpful to people over the long run. 
the major issues that I've been talking about, the censorship, the addiction to war, particularly the Ukraine war, and then most of all the chronic disease epidemic. And I think, you know, it gave me a platform to talk about those issues and a lot more people are about aware of them now and a lot more people are, it's part of the national conversation, which it was not 16 months ago. Yeah, I think people on the outside looking in don't realize what a sacrifice it is to make the decision you made. I mean, it's what, a 16 hour day is like a light day. <laughs> it's like, well, why get dressed if you're only gonna do 16 hours, right? And it's day after day after day. And then you decide to do what you did today. Why now? Was there a reason you did it today instead of two weeks ago or two weeks down the road? It was just a confluence of, of events. I actually would have rather done it, done it a little later. You know, I finished writing my speech today at 11.10 and the press conference started at 11 and I was 30 minutes away. So I was 45 minutes late for the conference because, you know, I had only had uh, really 24 hours to write my statement. And so I would have preferred to do it under a more relaxed regimen, but... Uh, well, you work well under pressure, though. I, I work well. We have a team that works well under pressure, and President Trump's staff had a whole series of other needs, and, you know, we basically, uh, uh, you know, we coalesced ar around their schedule. And I was with President Trump this morning, interviewed him in Las Vegas, and then I headed this way. He's not far behind me. And one of the things that I asked him was about you and what you were going to have to say today. And he had a comment about that for the record, and I wanted to share it with you and get your comments about that. RFK Jr. has offered his support to you and your campaign. How yes. do you feel about that? I'm very honored by it. He's a very uh, smart guy, a different kind of a guy, but very smart, loves our country, has uh, some I think very good views on a lot of different things. And I've known him for a long time. We've been somewhat friendly, actually. And I think he's gonna be a great asset. I think he adds a lot to the election. He's got a good following, tremendous following. I think he adds a lot to the election, and I think he adds a lot to if we win. I mean, he's got some very interesting ideas and good ideas. I think he'll be a fantastic and influential person in terms of, uh, getting this country back on track. I think uh, if we win, I think he can be very valuable to the country. And I think he can also help us build up the margins. Will he have a role in your administration? He's a very experienced trial lawyer. He is. Uh, he's, he's tried a lot of uh, large cases, so, and a lot of it environmental. So I uh, thought, you know, he might play a role environmentally, he might play could a role be. as attorney general. There's a lot of things he could offer to the administration. That's true. That's true. No, he's a very smart guy. And but you welcome uh, him. I do. You I've welcome known his him. support. Well, number one, I've known him a long time. Right. And I've always had a good relationship. I mean, we're sort of on opposite sides of some issues. But I've always had a good relationship with him. And I'm very honored by his support. Well, I've, I've spoken to him about you in the past. and. He's always spoken of you with a great deal of respect, even though you guys have been campaigning against each other. Yeah. He's always spoken of you with a great deal of respect. What's your reaction to his comments? You know, I think he's accurate. I, we've known each other for a long time. In fact, I've litigated against him. I've sued him a couple of times on golf courses that, uh, that he was building, or he's trying to build up in the New York State reservoir watershed, and I was suing to keep them from being built. But even during that time when I was litigating against him, he ended up giving me a ride to Florida on his, on his plane. So, and we were friendly, and you know, we had a great time and a lot of laughs. He's a very congenial, amiable, interesting guy, and very warm. Do you foresee pushing your agenda forward maybe as part of that administration? Is that a possibility? Yeah, I mean, we talked about that. We talked about his commitment to chronic disease. It's one of the things that brought us together. The, the, a couple of hours after his, the assassination attempt, Phil, I got a call from Kelly Means, who's kind of the leading advocate in the country 
against chronic disease and for against processed food, which is really poisoning our children. He's been advising me for a long time on and consulting with me. And he called me that night and he said that he was also advising President Trump on this issue, which made me happy that President Trump even you know knew about this issue. And he asked if I'd be willing to talk to President Trump, and I said yes, and President Trump then called me a little while later. Um, and then we ended up meeting with each other the following day and then doing a series of meetings. And a lot of that time we spent uh, talking about the Ukraine war, about uh, dismantling this addiction that we have to foreign wars, but also talking about the, the chronic disease epidemic. And you know, President Trump said that he wanted that as his legacy to, to solve it. So, uh, you know, I'll do anything that I can to make sure that happens. Having gotten to know you as I have, I have the feeling that you feel a sense of commitment to your supporters and to your donors and the things that they've supported and continued to. I can't imagine you telling them that that journey or fight is over. You're going to continue to push those issues and part of the way to do that might be through the administration or it could be in other ways, but there's no way you're going to let up on the things that you've been espousing. I heard you in your press conference thanking them for their support and letting them know it's that's not over. You're continuing those same agendas, those same priorities. That's still important to you. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to use my own resources, my energies and talents, you know, as long as I can. This is, to me, the most important issue in our country today because we have the highest chronic disease burden of any country in the world, and it's destroying us. It's $4.3 trillion a year. It's costing our country five times the military budget. When my uncle was president, the medical expenditures on chronic disease were zero. Today, it's 95% of our health care expenditures. It's, it's sinking our country. And we're getting sicker and sicker. We're, we're paying twice what Europeans do for, for health care. We have the worst health care outcomes in the world. It's all because we're being mass poisoned by processed foods, by pesticides, by chemicals, uh, by pharmaceutical drugs. And there's a series of industries that actually make money by keeping us sick. It's not just industries, but it's the med schools, the hospitals, the insurance companies you would think would want us healthy, but they actually make more money if we get sicker. And then, of course, the pharmaceutical companies, if you have a chronic disease, you're a lifetime patient. This drug, Ozempic, costs $1,500 uh, for, for a week. And there, there's now a bill before Congress that would force the insurance companies, Medicare, to pay for it for every American who's obese. Well, that's 74 percent of our population. Right. That's going to be three trillion dollars a year. And for a tiny fraction of that, you could give every American three meals a day of organic food, and diabetes would disappear overnight. You know, diabetes is treatable with food, right. with exercise, and obesity is. And, you know, what you talk about is empirically verified. This isn't just some theory that you hatch in your back room sometime. These things are factually based. They're empirical. And I think that's so important. It was important to me that whenever you we're talking about this, you were also talking about being blackballed by the media because we had so many people that were not wanting to put you on the air, ABC, NBC, CBS, all the major networks, and this has continued. Now, at Merritt Street, we put you on, of course, and going to continue yeah. to put you on as long as we can lure you in there <laughs> because we're talking about science. This isn't opinion. This is empirical science, evidence-based. Why do you think they're so threatened? The television networks are very, very dependent on pharmaceutical advertising. I knew Roger Ailes very well. Roger Ailes was, of course, the founder of Fox News and the CEO of Fox News for many years. He and I were on opposite sides of the political spectrum, but we had this friendship that, that survived all that. 
he would always made sure that I could get on his platform to talk about environmental issues. So I was the only environmentalist who was going on Sean Hannity and Bill O'Reilly and Neil Cavuto for many, many years. And I, at one point I made a film about the impacts of the relationship between mercury and this epidemic of neurological injuries and mercury in, in medical products. And I showed him the film and he, he said, you know, I have a family member who I think was um, injured by this. And he said, this is a really important film. He said, I can't allow you onto my network for this. Because for the evening news division, about 70% of our revenues are coming from pharmaceutical companies. And he said to me at that time that typically um, there are 23 ads on a, a evening news segment a show and that 17 of those on average are pharmaceutical. Mm -hmm. He said, if any of my hosts allowed you on TV, I'd have to fire them. And if I didn't, I would hear from Rupert, meaning Rupert Murdoch, within 10 minutes. Yeah. He was very clear to me about that. I've seen that evidence across the board with all of the networks. They're very, very sensitive to their advertisers. And those companies are advertising not just as a platform for selling product but also because they can dictate content. They can make sure that, you know, who's ever on that new show is, uh, is towing the line. Well, we had Kelly Means on my show, Dr. Phil Primetime, talking about the very things that you're focusing on here. And my audience was fascinated yeah. because there were things they had not heard before. Yeah. There, there were facts, information they had not heard. And that show, we put it on our we have an app, Merit Plus, where you can watch those shows after the fact. And that show just continued to, its audience grew and grew and grew. It continues to this day to grow based on the information that was given. Yeah. And people were fascinated yeah, by what he had to say. He's riveting. You're exactly right. And people don't know because the information is not being put out there. President Trump is going to talk about and we'll have a conversation about why these stakes are so high and how he and he alone is the candidate to lead us toward that path of peace, prosperity, and freedom. Join me in welcoming the next president of the United States, President Donald J. Trump.
bag. USA. 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 We love our country. We love our country, don't we? It's amazing. And it's a great country, but we have to take it back. Because our country's not feeling so well nowadays. And we're going to bring it back and we're going to make it healthy and beautiful and better than ever. And it's really, this is some crowd and you can duplicate the crowd outside. So, if anybody would like to give up your seat, that would be okay. No, no. <laughs> Let's have a good time. Thank you very much, everybody. That song gets me fired up every it's time. So Lee Greenwood is so great. Great guy, too. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Thank this you. This is a, a very special evening for us all to have a conversation about some of the real issues that are facing Americans across the country right. and that don't get talked about often enough. And I want to start with one that's very personal to me, hard to talk about sometimes. Um, this is only the second time I've spoken about it publicly, but my husband and I were married almost 10 years ago. We wanted to start a family. We were very excited about it. Unfortunately, it was very difficult. Uh, we, we were not successful in trying to get pregnant. For us, IVF seemed to be the only option and the last resort. Uh, as you know, it's a, it's a pretty difficult process. It's very, very expensive. Yeah. I was in Congress at the time traveling. I would carry the medicine that I had to administer shots to myself sometimes in an airport bathroom and and ultimately the most difficult part was every time going to the doctor for another transfer and, and hoping that it would result in a positive pregnancy test and then being heartbroken over and over every time that test came back negative. Now I know some of your opponents, your political opponents are saying that you want to ban IVF. While it didn't work for us, it's worked for a lot of families. And uh, I, I just know that there are women and, and couples in this crowd or those who are watching here tonight who may be going through this same struggle and are concerned about being able to have this option, either because they might not be able to afford it or they're concerned that it just may not be available. And I'd love for you to talk to them about how they should feel. Well, thank you very much, Tulsi. And I didn't know about your situation. And uh, it's tough stuff, right? Tough. Life is pretty tough. It can be beautiful, but it can be difficult. Uh, we are doing something with IVF, because IVF, as you know, from friends, and people you know, it's really worked out very well for a lot of people. It gave them a child when they would not have had a child. And uh, I told my people I wanted to look at this a couple of weeks ago. And as you know, we have uh, no taxes on a thing called tips. You know that? And I said, tell me. We did three things. We did that, and we did no tax for seniors on Social Security benefits. We want to have that. And I've been seeing a lot of uh, IVF, and I kept hearing that I'm against it, and I'm actually very much for it. In fact, in Alabama, where the uh, judge ruled against it, and I countered the judge and came out with a very strong statement for it and the Alabama you were very quick in your response the, to that I was but they were too they were amazing the legislature approved virtually my statement I mean full IVF and it is really gone it's it's terrific and I said so with the tips and with the social security uh, the no taxes on social security I said maybe for IVF and I, I've been looking at it and what we're going to do is for people that are using IVF, which is fertilization, we are, the government is going to pay for it, or we're going to get or mandate your insurance company to pay for it, which is going to be great. We're going to do that. I, I can't tell you how life-changing that would be for so many families, because it costs a lot of money. A lot of people go into debt just for the hope of being able to start 
their own family. Well, it's big. And you know what? We want to produce babies in this country, right? We want to produce babies. So I think it's going to be something we told. We, we sort of announced it a little bit. We were in a great place, Michigan. We all love Michigan, right? We're going to bring back the car industry. And we're going to get a lot of it back to Michigan. They've been uh, taking our cars away. They've been taking our manufacturing away over years, over decades. And if, if you look at it today, it's a, it's a shell of what it was years ago. But we're going to bring it back. Uh, Mexico is right now building massive car factories, actually being financed and built by China. And they think they're going to sell their cars back into our country. It's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. Oh, listen to that. That is not going to happen. But uh, so much, so many things have gone wrong in the car industry. The union leadership has been horrible. I think I'm going to win by 85 percent, the union, but because we're bringing it back. And we're going to have electric cars, but we're going to have gasoline powered cars and we're going to have uh, hybrids. We're going to have every kind of car. We're not going with just that. But I just felt that. Uh, it would be a good place to announce it. And we did sort of the announcement there a little bit. And now we do the big announcement tonight in front of all of these uh, television stations, all of the fake news, you know, the fake, so they're all over the place. They're all over the place. I don't know what's going on. We don't even know, I was saying, because we're doing this. And I finished and I figured I was going to come here and uh, we're going to make a speech. I had a speech all set for you. I, I was ready. Yeah, they said, sir, you're actually doing a town hall. I said, oh, nobody <laughs> told me that. I said, who's doing it? They said, Tulsi. I said, well, that's at least good news. She's been, I've been a fan of hers for a long time, I have to tell you. So, so I didn't even know. I'm, I'm in the plane and uh, I'm looking over some material and we're going to give you a hell of a speech tonight. We were set to give you one hell of a speech. They said, no, sir, it's a town hall. I said, why doesn't somebody tell me this stuff? <laughs> and I don't even have any idea who we're doing it for. I don't know. Is it for a network or what? I see a lot of television all over the place. So maybe it's on all of them. But I did get to see uh, the strangest thing today. I looked at the news conference of Kamala. I call her Comrade. Comrade Kamala. Comrade Kamala. She's a... Uh, you know that she's uh, a Marxist. Her father was a Marxist before her. So she was brought up in the family tradition. And she really is. And this country is not ready for a Marxist. We don't want a Marxist as a president. And she destroyed San Francisco. She destroyed California. And we're not going to let it destroy our country. I'll tell you, it's not going to happen. So. But just. To finish, so for some reason she doesn't want to talk to anybody. So she's either not the smartest light in the ceiling. I'm trying to be nice here. I want to be there. They say, be nice, sir, be nice. I, you know, it's hard to be nice when somebody is destroying your country and wants to destroy your country. It's hard to be like nice. But, but she is, um, she was a terrible vice president. She was a terrible border czar, worse than history, probably, not just in this country, but the border, you know, uh, millions and millions of people, I say 20 million plus, have poured through the border during their term. I had the safest border in the history of our country. They have the most unsafe border in the history of the world. And they're coming through, and many of them are from prisons and jails. There's a slight difference, as you know, prisons and jails. Many are from mental institutions and insane asylums, and many are terrorists, and they're pouring into our country at a level. I don't know if you saw the news today, Tulsi. They had a group of a lot of them, Venezuelan people with lots of machine guns, taking over a building someplace. I, I'm looking, I'm saying, where is that? They went in and they took over a building. This is just the beginning. They're taking their criminals from all over the world, not just South America, not just Venezuela, which you've been reading about. All over the world, they're taking their criminals and they're dumping them into the United States. Kamala, that's Kamala, is allowing it to happen. And they actually want to, actually, they want to give them papers. They want to make them citizens and they want to give them your Social Security. They want to give them your Medicare. 
and your Social Security will collapse under her. I'm the one that's going to protect the Social Security. But they're coming. I will totally protect, as I did for four years. And there was no age increase. There was no anything. We're going to protect. You know, they destroy you with inflation, and then they want to destroy your Social Security. So it's not going to happen. But this is going to be the most important election in the history of our country. So I just want to say that it's an honor to be with you tonight. It's a forum that's very different because I have no idea who the hell is broadcasting it. But all we'll do is we'll talk because we're friends. I love this state. I gave them uh, Marinette. Uh, we, we gave them a very big, you know, Tulsi, we have a, a ship contract. And as you know, we gave uh, Marinette yards, but we gave them a tremendous contract. They wanted it all over the country. I said, we're going to get it for Wisconsin, and it's a big one. And they're doing a great job, I understand. So we got that. And uh, we're going to have a good time tonight. So let's go. Mr. President, you, you talked about immigration. We actually have Amber here who's quite concerned about that, and she's got a question for you. Mr. President, hello. hello. <laughs> My name is Amber, and I'm from Cameron, Wisconsin. I have three beautiful children, and I'm torn on who to support. My youngest daughter is here tonight. My oldest son is 18, and he just started trade school this week. <laughs> Very proud of him. My concern is that illegal immigration is threatening opportunities for my children. I worry that it's taking away jobs from Americans. I'm wondering, what will you do about that? All right, well, it's great. I think I'll stand up and... Do you mind if I turn around? Um, thank you, Amber, very much. And you're right. I'll tell you, we have the people that I'm talking about they're pouring in at levels never seen before. They're coming in by millions and millions, and a lot of them are taking the jobs for the black population, the Hispanic population, and unions are going to be very badly affected because, and I was talking to some of the union heads who I actually do get along with, but uh, they're very concerned about it because the jobs that are, the people that are coming in are just taken it, and it's going to start with the black population african americans are losing their jobs and i don't know if you heard the uh, latest statistic that of the jobs that these people created which is very little every single job was taken about 107 percent was taken by illegal immigrants there's been no job creation from them the jobs were filled by illegal immigrants with all of that being said, I want to give you a very positive answer. We're going to win this election. We're going to turn this country around. We're going to become an unbelievable growth country. And your boy is going to have the greatest job. And you, you want to have a lot of choice with jobs. You know, you want them to go up and they get up and they, uh, it's hard to believe I have that with the way I get treated. But I look, I look forward to every day because we're going to make America great again. So I really do. I look forward to it. That's right. But, but we're going to, we're going to create a lot of jobs. We're going to create, does he want to stay here? Or does he want to go to a different state or anything? Yeah, someplace in the Midwest. But this is a good place to stay, right? Wisconsin. So we'll be creating tremendous jobs for our country. And we're also turning away. You know, we're going to be closing the border, really closing it. By the way, did you see? So Kamala was for defunding the police. She was for open borders. She was for everything that you're not against. I could go through 14 different. She's changed on every single one of them. In fact, I think we should make, see the man in the red hat and the beautiful woman in the red hat says, make America great again. Perhaps we should give Kamala a make America great again hat, right? But the problem is, that's not her belief. Her belief is open borders. Her belief, belief is uh, getting rid of Social Security. Her belief is doing all of these plans, like for health insurance, where you have one big government-run mess. And if you have private plans, a lot of the people in this room have private plans. They're incredible plans. They worked hard to get those plans, and that's what they want. But with her, she wants to have, it's really a communist type of government. And I just saw her, Telsey, on, she was sitting behind a desk doing this interview, 
And I said, Dana Bash, you could make yourself big tonight. All you have to do is be fair. I haven't seen the questions, but they gave out a sample. In fact, she's going to be on later on tonight uh, with a taped. It was a taped. We're doing it live. Why are we doing it live and she's doing it taped? But... But, That's right. He's real. But she was sitting behind that desk, this massive desk, and she didn't look like a leader to me, I'll be honest. I don't see her negotiating with President Xi of China. I don't see her with Kim Jong-un like we did with Kim Jong-un. So we're going to have to see what happens. I'll tell you what, November 5th is going to be the most important day in the history of this country. Go for it. Mr. President, there are a lot of people who want to feel hopeful about our future. I want to introduce you to Luke, who is one of those people. Hi. Hello, Mr. President. Good looking guy. Thank you. My name is Luke Pulaski, and I'm a junior here at the University of Wisconsin La Crosse. I'll be voting for the first time in November, and I'm researching each candidate. I have two questions for you. First, as I've been living on my own and buying my own gas and groceries, I have noticed that everything has become more expensive. For me personally, I try to eat healthy and stay lean. A pound of meat has gone from $4 to almost $7. I also would like to buy a home someday, but that seems just impossible now. What's your plan to make life more affordable and bring down inflation for someone like me? Very good, thank you. Good. It's probably the question I get most. You know, they say you're going to vote with your stomach. I don't know if you've heard it, but it's a little bit true. And groceries, food has gone up at levels that nobody's ever seen before. We've never seen anything like it, 50, 60, 70 percent. You take a look at bacon and some of these products, and some people don't eat bacon anymore. And uh, we are going to get the energy prices down. When we get energy down, you know, this was caused by their horrible energy Wind, they want wind all over the place. But when it doesn't blow, we have a little problem. This was caused by energy. This was really caused by energy and also their unbelievable spending. They're spending us out of, out of wealth, actually. They're taking our wealth away. But it was caused by energy. And what they've done is they started cutting way back. We were in third place. When I left, we were by far in first place, beating Russia, beating Saudi Arabia. And we were going to dominate to a level that we've never seen before. And then we had a bad election. I'll be very nice. I'm supposed to be nice when I talk about the election because everybody's afraid to talk about, oh, please, sir, don't talk about the election, please. You know, if you can't, if you can't talk about a bad election, you really don't have a democracy if you think about it, right? But, but what they did, Tulsi, is they took, they took back the oil production the oil started going crazy. That started the inflation. Then they went back. They said, go back to where Trump was. The problem is that we would have been three times that level right now. We, are, we would have been so dominant over Russia and uh, Saudi Arabia. Look, Saudi Arabia, Russia, a lot of oil. We would have had more. You know, we had something in Alaska, Anwar, that we, that I created. I mean, Ronald Reagan wanted it. You remember Ronald Reagan wanted it. They all wanted it. And I got it approved. Nobody was able to get it approved. I got it approved. And they, the first week in office, they turned it back. They said, no, it's the biggest site possibly in the world. Could be bigger than Saudi Arabia. Well, we're going to start that up. We're going to become the energy capital of the world. We're going to pay down our debt and we're going to reduce your taxes still further. And your groceries are going to come tumbling down and your interest rates are going to be tumbling down. And then you're going to go out, you're going to buy a beautiful house, okay? You're going to buy a beautiful house. That's called the American dream. The American dream. Thank you. Mr. President, I, I want to ask you a question about national security, but first I think it's important to point out what Luke is talking about, the cost of groceries, the cost of gas, the cost of housing, mortgages, rent, everything has gone up. Kamala Harris's plan that she's announced is government price controls. And I think it's important to touch on, you just laid out your plan. What's going to happen if Kamala Harris institutes price controls? So that's a communist plan. It's never worked. And it's been tried by others. Believe it or not, Richard Nixon tried it. A lot of people tried it. 
It's been tried many times, and it always leads to the same failure. Uh, tremendous inflation, lack of product. You don't have anything. The stores are not stocked. It has never worked. It's called control. They want control. And, uh, you know, look, it just, it's been so often. And everybody that comes in, they say it. It sort of sounds great. We're going to go price control. Actually, when she announced it, she got absolutely slaughtered by even Democrats because it doesn't work. It's, it's a known loser. So now she doesn't talk about it. Do you notice she doesn't talk about climate change anymore? She's not talking about it. You know why? Because people don't want to hear it. They want to find, they want to live a good life. They want to live a life. They don't want to stop your industry with climate change. They used to call it different things, global warming. Remember, that wasn't working because it was getting a little bit cooler. So they said, what are we going to do? We'll call it global cooling. No. So they came up with the word words climate change because that takes care of everything. It climate change. The climate's changing. But according to them, we're all going to be gone at about what do we have? Three years left. They had 12 years. Remember? So in about three years, let me tell you, we do have a problem, though. It's climate change, but a different kind of climate change. It's called nuclear global warming. We can say that's global warming. And if we don't have a smart president, you know, you have five nations now with pretty massive nuclear power. Some have very massive, including us and Russia. China's behind, way behind, but within four or five years, they'll catch up. And we don't want them to catch up. Look, we... The biggest problem, in my opinion, the biggest problem our country has, the biggest problem the world has, is nuclear weapons. They are a destructive force, the likes of which nobody has ever seen before. And we have to make sure they're never used. We have to make sure it's not going to happen. You're, you're exactly right. You brought up Ronald Reagan already. Ronald Reagan famously said, a nuclear war can never be won and should never be fought. And I think it's interesting you talked about climate change, Mr. President. The Democrats and Kamala Harris, they were quick to talk about how climate change is an existential threat. But what they're not talking about is the existential threat of nuclear war and World War III, which is exactly where we sit today because of the warmongers and their puppets, Joe Biden, and Kamala Harris. And they don't want to talk about it because the, the consequence of where they have taken all of us as the American people and the world is economic hardship around the world, a destruction of our economic well-being, and an annihilation of humanity, our families, our kids, our communities around the world. There was a recent poll that uh, YouGov did that, that pointed out over 60% of Americans feel that World War III and nuclear war is going to happen within five to 10 years. And, and when I heard that, I, I felt so sad because they're at a point where they feel like this outcome, the annihilation of the world is inevitable. So I, I wanted to ask you about this because it's important that people understand what kind of leadership you bring, what you will do to stop this slide towards nuclear war and World War III so that we can feel hopeful again. Well, thank you. So, Viktor Orban, a very strong leader from Hungary, Prime Minister of Hungary, they asked him recently about what's the problem in the world. A few years ago, during my term, we had no pro we didn't have Israel being attacked. We didn't have Russia attacking Ukraine. And they asked him, why is it so bad now? The Middle East is on fire. Uh, so many places are on fire. And there are plenty uh, places that could very well and very quickly catch on. What's the problem? He said, you have to bring Trump back as president of the United States. You will have no problem. He single-handedly kept things. And it's true. And I could do it with telephone calls by being smart. But literally, he said, you have to bring Trump back. Now, he used a term I wouldn't use. He said everybody was afraid of Trump. You know who was afraid of Trump? They said China was afraid of Trump. Russia was afraid of Trump. They were all, and I don't want to say that. I will say this. They respected me and they respected our nation. They don't respect our nation anymore. They don't respect our nation anymore. Think of it. What would the world be like? If Russia didn't do what they did, and they would have never done it. I used to speak to Putin about it. I had a very good relationship. Uh, no chance. You know what happened, I think, uh, Afghanistan, when he saw the horrible 
leadership that we were displayed that we displayed in Afghanistan, I think he said, "Wow, this is a time to to go in." Because I wasn't there, he would have never done it if I was president, and Israel would have never been attacked. Think of it: what would this world be like? You wouldn't have had that disaster, and was it leaving Afghanistan? And they should have kept Bagram. That's the big air base. It's one hour away from where China makes its nuclear weapons. They didn't keep it. You know who occupies it now, Tulsi? China occupies it. So we have. Uh, if you have the right president, and we don't right now, right now, do we even have a president? He just came in. Think of it. He just came in from wherever the hell he went. You know, there was a coup. He just doesn't know it yet. But there was a coup. How about that? He got 14. I'm not a fan of his. He was the worst president. But, not. but think of this. He got 14 million votes. She was the first one to leave, you know. Kamala was the first one to quit. She never made it to the first state in the primaries, which was Iowa, never even came close. Other people did, but she never even came close. And all of a sudden, she was picked, and she's now running for president. And look, it just started, really. It just really started. The polls have us up here. We're up in this state. We're up in states, but it's close. It's close. It's, it's close, and you know, they cheat like hell, so we don't want to have it too close, but we have, because we have to get, we have to win this. We're not going to have a country. But with him, I was so far up, we had a thing called, the, how did he do in the debate? Did you think he did well? Not too good? No, they, he, they wanted to have a debate. I said, okay, it's a little bit early, isn't it? I was like, I was trying to talk them out. I said, well, it's a little early for a debate, right? And they said, well, well I think we'd like to do it. And that was not a good debate for them. That was not a good debate. So that was the beginning of the end for him. And they started looking. But they picked a woman that had absolutely no votes. She got no votes. And now she's running. So when you say threat to democracy, they are a threat to democracy. I'm not a threat to democracy. I'm not a threat. Thank you. Mr. President, crime and the rise of crime is, is on the minds of a lot of people. I want to call on Danielle here, um, who has a question for you. Hi, Danielle. Well, you need, yeah, it's a, and you get a lot of those questions from Minnesota. But you get a lot of those questions because Minnesota, I mean, they picked this guy. He is weird. Huh? He's weird. I'm not weird. He's weird. No, he's a weird guy. He's a weird dude. You know, see, they come up with sound bites. Every, they always have sound bites. And one of the things is that JD and I are weird. What that, that guy is so straight. JD is so, he's doing a great job, smart, top student, great guy. And he's not weird, and I'm not weird. I mean, we're a lot of things, we're not weird, I will tell you. But that guy is weird, don't you think? You know, he called, he signed for, uh, and this is. Who would think that this is even happening in our country with men playing in women's sports and all of this? But he has it. He has it at a level that nobody can believe. A bill that every boy's bathroom will have tampons. Okay. Hence his name. Tampon Tim. But, but think of it. Think of it. And you know, on the question of abortion, he is the one abortion in the ninth month and if the baby in minnesota and i'd love to win minnesota because those people aren't digging this guy they're not digging this guy but think of this six states six states minnesota is one of them if the baby is born you're allowed to execute the baby after think of that after birth in minnesota you're allowed to execute and you remember the former governor, not the current governor, who's terrific, Len Youngkin. We're going to win maybe with Virginia. We could do that. But the former governor, and he said, uh, 
you sit the ba- you sit the mother down and the father down, you sit them down and you talk, and the baby is born and you make a decision what to do. He meant, do you execute the baby after birth? And according to what they have passed and legislation in Minnesota, they're allowed to execute the baby after birth. And this guy is a participant. And that's why she picked him, because she is, in fact, a Marxist slash communist. Remember, I'd say all the time, our country will never be socialist, right? We will not have a socialist. Well, I was right. We skipped socialism. We went to communism. This woman has to be stopped. Mr. President, we have time for one final question. I don't know if we can get a mic to Bernardo. Uh, He's got an important question, given very soon we will be honoring the anniversary of September 11th and all of the lives that were lost on that tragic day and that tragic attack where we were attacked by radical Islamist terrorists. And Bernardo wanted to, to share his thoughts and had a question for you on this. Thank you. Mr. President, my name is Bernardo. I'm a voter here in Wisconsin, live in the wonderful lacrosse county here and (laughs) i'm also a father of eight i have seven here with me (laughs) and uh it's the anniversary of 9 11 is coming up i'm concerned that we're more vulnerable now than ever And we have a Democrat nominee who doesn't even want to say the words, says we shouldn't say the words, radical Islamic terror. How are we going to protect America from a terrorist attack? Uh, First of all, it's a great question. And, you know, we have radical Islamists pouring into our country along with everybody else right now. They're coming in at levels that nobody's ever seen before. We kept them out. We had one year where Border Patrol put down, it was, I believe, 2019, where they, and I don't believe this, I don't believe it's right, but uh, I'll take it. They said zero came in in 20, that was my term, zero. Now we have thousands. I'd like to say that was true. It's probably not because I can't imagine that, but we, we were very tough on that. Now they have thousands and thousands coming in, along with the prisoners and along with the crime. And remember, a lot of these countries like Venezuela, their crime is way down because they've moved their criminals into our country. It's not even believable. But your question on Islamists and all of the jihad and all of the things that they talk about, they have to respect your country. They have to respect your leader. You know, I had no radical Islam crime for four years, and I didn't want to talk about it. I wanted to, I I talked about it after, but I didn't want to talk about it to her. I don't want to say like, I had absolutely, and the next day you get hit, but we had none, four years of it, because they respected your president, they respected your country, and they have to, we have to bring back that level of respect, and we're going to do it, we're going to do it, and we're not letting the wrong people into our country. Okay, thank you very much. Great question. Thank you, Mr. President. I know you have run out of time here, but thank you for having this conversation with the people of Wisconsin and people across the country who are watching and concerned about these very same issues. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank Thank you, you everyone, for being here. Thank you, everybody. Vote. Vote. Thank you, everybody. All right, there you have it. Former President Trump uh, in this panel discussion moderated by Tulsi Gabbard there. Taking questions uh, from the audience, questions about the issue of illegal immigration, also about uh, foreign policy. That last question about some Americans' concerns that uh, the U.S. is vulnerable to another attack in the same vein as the 9-11 terror attacks as we approach the 23rd anniversary of 9-11 there. So uh, speaking in La Crosse, Wisconsin, you know, this wasn't his normal campaign rally style format. It was a sit down panel, took a few questions uh, from some undecided voters, but these are most of his supporters here, there in La Crosse, Wisconsin. So he also got a question on economy and inflation about the very high cost of food 
when Americans go to the grocery store. So, uh, like we have been throughout this cycle, you have been watching so many of these speeches and events from the candidates, Trump and Vance and Harris and Walls, of course, in just about 10 minutes time.